All right, well, everyone, welcome back to our, uh, in our panel discussion here at a conference. And uh, well, we'll just, just jump right in. Um, the theme of this conference is taking up the urgent task of missions and church planting. What do you gentlemen think is the proper relationship between missions and church planting? I'll say something and then the other guys can correct me, okay? Uh, that, could, that question could be taken several different ways, couldn't it? But uh, missions is church planning, uh, and I guess uh, in, in some other country, but it's the same thing as we do here, only with the complications of doing it in a diff different country. Great, the Great Commission commands planting churches, and whether it's close to home or far from home, uh, that's what it commands, and that's what we're supposed to do. Church planting is, is the ultimate goal of all missionary activity. Even missionary activity, it, it would be called personal evangelism, personal discipleship, even mercy ministries with regard to medical needs and hospitals. I know of a Reformed Baptist doctor who has, through his hospital, planted like 11 churches. And so it's the ultimate goal of the Great Commission. Another thing is... Always realize this, missions is just one biblical church training elder qualified men and sending them out to plant another biblical church, whether it's at home or abroad. And then finally, one thing that I would say, and if I were to begin a seminary, like I were to have a seminary, and, and my whole life has been world missions, I probably wouldn't have a missions department I would call it an ecclesiology department because basically missions is ecclesiology, extending itself, growing, making disciples. What's the name of your class, Professor Miller? Isn't that evangelism, church planning and missions? Isn't that, am I right there? Missions, that's right. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, <clears throat> certainly don't have any corrections. Of that, and I just <clears throat> give perhaps another reason for it is because when you, you plant a church, you're, you're planting the body within which people grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so the entire purpose of the Great Commission, as Sam was preaching this, this morning, has to do with, with planting a church, not only that will plant other churches, but can be the body in which the fullness of Christ's operation and his people can be done through the preaching of the word. Paul was so... Uh, eager to go back to Thessalonica. He keeps talking about that in 1 Thessalonians because he wanted to complete what was lacking in their faith. He wanted to, be, to help them in their faith. Even though he was convinced that they were genuinely converted and they were a church, there's still more that happens in the context of the church. And so the, the church planning aspect, whether it's here or whether it's on the field, is, is that which is consistent with how God is going to work in the people that he redeems to conform them to the image of Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, so what important aspects of missions and church planting do you feel have been neglected by the modern church and what problems have arisen because of that neglect? I'll just say, I mean, I think we just answered that question in the sense that at least one of the main ones uh, is ecclesiology, is what has been neglected, and the lack of grasping and understanding that it is the church that has been given the commission uh, in that way. We've heard that already from the message, both messages, uh, both from Brother Paul and Sam. I think something that's very important is to realize that he says teaching them, go teaching them. Missions is a theological endeavor. So to dumb down the theology of missions in order to carry out a theological endeavor is self-destructive and it's also absurd. Another problem is sola scriptura. You and I have no right to invent in the same way that Moses had no right to redesign. He wasn't asked to design 
the tabernacle. He was asked to follow, commanded to follow the design that God had ordained. It's the same way in missions. And, and Sola Scriptura not only applies to our theology, it, it applies to our praxis, our methodology. Another thing that's been grossly overlooked, and it's the reason why many times I won't participate in certain um, missions conferences, is because 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds are being told to abandon all and go to the mission field. And, and that's not at all what should be done. We need a call to the youngest of saints to be missionaries. But if someone aspires to the work of a missionary, he must qualify to be a missionary. And I believe those, that qualification is an elder qualification. If they are participating in proclamation, it is a matter of authority. And um, young people can go to the mission field but they must go from one elder sending to another elder receiving and work under and in that context. Another thing that's always the case, and we've already mentioned it, is that church planting is the goal. It's not how many people raised their hands, how many people did this or that. I was coming back years ago from uh, Europe, and I just happened to sit beside a mission statistician, I believe he called himself. And he started talking about people groups that had been reached. And I was thinking, as he's saying these names, I'm going, I know they're not reached. I know they're not reached. And so I asked him, in your definition, what is a reached people group? And he says, a people that have lived within walking distance of where the Jesus film has been shown. So that gives you an idea of what's going on in world missions. You know, one of the things that we constantly say to men in our own church for our students, and which I think dovetails with what Paul just said, is that um, you need to have both an external and an internal call to the, to the ministry. Uh, you cannot call yourself, and the fact that you feel called isn't sufficient. Um, Paul, in Romans 12, not Paul Washer, the Apostle Paul, uh, <laughs> but said that we ought to think soberly and not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And I know that when I was learning this, uh, the importance of an external call to the ministry, uh, I, that text dawned on me. And one of the things, uh, as I thought about the text that has stuck with me, and I've said it to probably a number of you guys sitting here is this, uh, look, you need to think soberly. Now, what's the mark of sobriety? Or, or let's put, turn it around, what's the mark of insobriety? What's the mark of somebody that's high on drugs or alcohol or somebody else, some, something else? The mark is that they see things that other people don't. And if you see yourself as called to the ministry and your local church doesn't see it, there's a problem there someplace with sobriety. You know, another thing that strikes me often as I'm reading through my New Testament that seems to have been lost in missions is two by two. Christ sent them out two by two. Paul and Barnabas went out two by two. And even when they split up, they each separated, went two by two. We're just sending men out on their own, willy-nilly, without the support that the Bible prescribes. When in my first years in Peru, there's a, a denomination called the Christian Missionary Alliance, and um, they had some solid at the, before the charismatic movement. They had some really solid evangelical churches, mainline evangelicalism. One of the things I noticed between what they did and what the Baptists did is Baptists would send out one man and his wife and they would sometimes be in a little place preaching for months and he's just preaching to his wife and he's doing everything. The, the Christian Missionary Alliance, they sent out a preacher, an evangelist music guy and about 20 of their best members. So the first day... 
they had almost a functioning, immature, but a functioning church. And uh, they were able to do so much more, uh, so much more quickly. I think that's a great point. Um, next question is, uh, what type of challenges arise in the mission field when others who are also sent to preach the gospel are coming from a different theological background? Should one with reformed convictions seek to work together at some level with another with a Pentecostal background, for instance? Are there benefits from teamwork under such circumstances, or are the dangers and pitfalls too great to consider cooperation? Well, I think this relates to the last question that was discussed, and that is if a team has been sent out that is a sufficiently qualified team and of sufficient numbers to meet the, the biblical model, then you can maintain amicable relationships with those who different who have a different theological position on certain things that are not vital, like the deity of Christ or substitutionary atonement or something like that, but differ in some ecclesiological issues. Or, but if the team is sufficient, then you don't need to establish any kind of appearance of, of cooperation in the mission. You can maintain fraternal relationships without trying to work at the same goal. If you're there to establish churches and there are different ecclesiological view, viewpoints, then there's a certain point at which you, you go beyond the ability to cooperate. And so uh, the goal should be to maintain amicable relationships with people who are genuinely Christian so you can show a model. And even when there are, are differences on some matters, you can show a model of what it means to be tolerant and what it means to be able to discuss things without becoming unfraternal. Uh, in, in those discussions, but at the same time, you can manifest a commitment uh, and obedience to uh, the truth as you try to establish a church based on the clear principles, not only theologically of, of orthodoxy and evangelicalism, but, but on issues of what a church should be, a believer's baptism and growing in grace and preparation of people for ministry and so forth. So there's a, there has to be, I think, a biblical integration of, of, of fellowship with all Christians and yet at the same time maintaining your uh, appointment to, to found true local churches. Just a warning to some of the young people who might be thinking about missions. Generally, now this is not always the rule, but if you go to some mission sending group or something and you look at their theological statement. If it is not very specific, uh, that should already be a red flag. But what you need to understand is the, the theological statement you see on the website, more than likely when you get to the field, it'll be far more watered down than that. And never, never forget, uh, seminary students sitting in a hallway can uh, throw out all kinds of different views and ideas and everything else. But elders, uh, they don't have that luxury. Um, that's why a, a confession and unity in that confession, because if there's not, if there's not unity in the elders or unity in those church planting elders, how is there going to be unity of mind in the congregation? It's going to be division. Yet at the same time, I, I wanted to, I wrote down here, I wanted to point something else out. We need to have our feet firmly established in the confession, in the truths that we believe, in the scriptures. But we must also reach out to people. There are so many people who have been genuinely saved, yet never had the privileges of those who are sitting in this church. They never had the privileges of, of all the literature, all the preaching uh, that, that many of you have, have received. And I, I can point to two different illustrations. One is Conrad and Bewe and the Reformed Baptist in Zambia. They have ministerial training schools. They have three different ones. And you'd be surprised how many men have come from Pentecostalism and charismatic, and they have gotten converted. Pastors have gotten converted. Or others that have come to understand the great truths of Scripture and abandon this modern folly. And the same can be said in Brazil. Um, how godly men, Calvinistic men, 
both Presbyterian and Baptist, have reached out to this massive heretical movement and seen many people brought to a mature understanding of, of the faith. We, we must be loving. If, if our doctrine can't make us loving, then it, it's still probably good doctrine, but you're just not understanding it. You know, yeah, this, if, if missions is church planning, and if church planning requires a specific and shared vision, then at some level, uh, you have to have confessional uniformity or unity uh, to plan a local church, and that means you need to have that kind of unity in doing missions. Now, should someone doing that try in all sorts of ways to influence, be kind, loving, helpful to other churches and other missionaries? Of course, and are there probably levels at which some cooperation could be done? Of course, but uh, in terms of church planning, you've got to have a specific and shared vision, and, uh, and that th I think that means a common confession of faith. In areas where it is illegal to evangelize and convert someone to Christianity, like Morocco, for instance, what are the best ways to meet partners for the gospel and quietly plant churches? In almost every case, take Morocco, for instance, take even some of the strictest Arabic speaking countries, there will be God's elect. There will be people converted and there will be men working. Uh, they may have a very simple or primitive theology, but they have genuinely been converted. Now, here's what you need to understand about missions. Missions is, is not that difficult. You look at the indigenous person and you ask yourself what is in their hand then you look at yourself and ask, what's in my hand? And if there's something in my hand that's not in their hand, that's where I need to strike. Um, I was uh, with some believers in Indonesia uh, several years ago, and I said, you don't need to, these were cross-cultural Western missionaries, and I said, you don't need to be running around the streets of Jakarta preaching the gospel and getting thrown out of the country. That isn't helping anyone. But you've had seminary training. You know Greek, you know Hebrew, you've studied theology. What you need to do is find all these men that are in these house churches and every other place, and you need to pour what you have, what you have received in God's providence, you need to pour that into them. And in a way, I mean, that's, that's what's going on with, um, with Covenant and other places. They're going around... Um, I guess Sam could do Sam can do evangelism, but there's no sense him going to Colombia and doing evangelism when they're better evangelists. But the theology that they need to strengthen their churches, that's what he needs to bring. That's what covenant needs to bring. And all of us need to adopt that attitude. What do I have in God's providence that they don't have? And then pour what I have into them. I think we have attention. <clears throat> in this whole thing because we have so many examples of, of martyrs, the voice of the martyrs. And the, uh, we have admonitions that we will have tribulation, that we must take up our cross and follow Christ. And so I, I guess a part of what we need to think about is who is it that, sh that should die or who is it that should get run out of a country? And I've thought about that same thing, that sometimes we may mistake our foolishness for bravery when what is going to happen to you if you're in some countries they're not going to make a martyr out of you they're just going to export you and not allow you to come back and so your witness is lost but then there are those who are there and they're going to be persecuted too and so they have to be willing to die for the faith uh, and <clears throat> the question is when, when when should a missionary also be willing to die for the faith this is a question with, with me, and I, I wonder sometimes if, if I were there, if I were preaching, and they told me, if you keep preaching, then we're going to bring you up for capital crimes. Would I quit preaching and leave, or would I keep preaching and die? 
And is that a matter of, I'm, I'm asking the panel this too, is that a matter of wisdom? Do, do we have an option to decide when we should do that? Or if the threat is such that, well, they're asking me to do something that I know I have to do. So I've got to be willing to die for this. At, at what point do we make that decision between being thrown out and dying? We're there for the edification, the building up of that indigenous church. When a missionary goes out and does something wild, and gets thrown out of the country, he just gets thrown out of the country and then he can go around to every church in the United States talking about how he got thrown out of the country. But it, but persecution may erupt for that indigenous church that can't get on an airplane and leave. And so it's always a, the question of, of love. If if my martyrdom will result in the benefit of that local church, then let it let it happen. But if it's going to just cause grief, you know, so it's always a question of what impact will my life have on the church? Listen, men, I know what it's like. And wisdom is required. Wisdom is required. And um, and never forget, it's all about God's people in that country and not about you or your ministry. And um, so this is one of the things I think that's so important that in the ministry, especially in pastoring, do you notice that the scriptures do not give us an answer for every situation that pops up? But it te does tell us what kind of men we must be. Mm -hmm. And so if we have the character and the wisdom of men grounded in the scriptures, we're probably going to make the right choice if we are also uh, gathering counsel from other wise individuals. Um, and so great prayer, always staying in scripture and being sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, 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 I've been expounding the book of Acts and uh, what I see there kind of just completely confirms what you're saying, Paul, because uh, at, at, in city after city, there were conspiracies and the brothers got together and they said, Paul, you got to leave. You're in trouble. You got to leave. And he left and he left and he left and he left after preaching the gospel. So apparently there was nothing wrong with doing that. But, and I hadn't thought of it just this way, but when, when uh, now he's got to go to Jerusalem with that offering and he's got a, uh, I, I guess he felt a, a holy obligation to bring that offering of the Gentiles to the Jewish church in Jerusalem. And they and the brothers keep saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. The Holy Spirit says you're going to be chained and put in bondage there. Paul went anyway. Uh, and I guess that's, that's where you come back to. You need judgment and wisdom with regard to what kind of situation you're in. But it's not wrong to flee in order to preach the gospel another day. Yeah, I was going to say, you see as well in Acts 18 with the riot at Ephesus, he wants to go back into it. Right. And his own brothers held him back from it at that time. But then to go back to what Paul was saying as well, this Paul, not the Apostle Paul, uh, but then to say what Apostle Paul said, <laughs> which is... They're consistent with each other. They also. are. They're on this point. <laughs> And that is, he knew that his imprisonment was for the furtherance of the gospel. Philippians 1. Yeah. My imprisonment was not against it, it was for. Yeah. And the whole palace guard has heard the gospel. Yeah. And so that is, that, that principle of love for God and for God's people in his church is the wisdom that's needed. And he goes on. This is a question. He goes on to say, and many of the brethren of the Lord have become confident because of my bonds have been much more bold to speak the word of God without fear. So it encouraged others to preach. But he said, some preach out of envy and rivalry, hoping to add affliction to my bonds, and some do it out of goodwill. Now, I'm assuming that Paul believed both of these were really preaching the gospel. Both of them were genuine Christians. But there was some sort of uh, jealousy or some sort of envy that had arisen because of maybe Paul's popularity or because of the position God had put him in as sort of the, the chief of the apostles. But is that is that a dynamic that you see sometime on the mission field? How do you control that dynamic when you realize that there are good people who are preaching the truth and are very effective in ministry, but they develop some sort of a rivalry with each other? 
How, how is that to be handled? It's a theological problem. One of the things that temper men more than anything else, if they will just believe that God is the God who sees. He's the God who sees. He sees into your heart. He knows what you're doing. And, and all these things of rivalry and trying to get a name and everything else, it's all the result of not knowing God. Because if you believe in the God who sees, then you'll be content before him. And, and, but, but I have seen that on the mission field. And I, I see it here. And I see it on people clamoring for attention by opening up blogs and trying to get a following and all these different things. It's, it's, it's ruining uh, many good men and, uh, and fighting all the time. Fighting all the time. You know, people used to ask me, are you a Calvinist? And I say, yes, I am, but I'm not angry about it. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so we need to be very, very careful. When you do those things, you're just demonstrating you're a very little man. That's what the whole letter of 1 Corinthians is really all about, isn't it? I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Christ. You are arrogant. Paul says in that letter to them, you don't know anything about love. Let me show you the more excellent way. If someone is called to missions, how should they seek to be prepared for that vocation? I'm laughing because I think, you know, at, like the lawyer said or the judge said, ask and answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, they need to be uh, putting themselves under godly elders, preparing for the ministry, getting trained and uh, theologically trained for the ministry. And they need to seek to have their own internal call uh, confirmed by godly men in a godly church. And, uh, and fundamentally, I think this is Paul's point. Uh, that he's been making, this is the same thing, whether it's home church planning or foreign church planning. Absolutely. It's in the context of, you see, again, go back to qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1. Who's going, to, uh, who's going to judge those things? Those are character qualifications by and large. Who is going to judge those things? It must be done in the context of not just elders, but a congregation. A congregation. Another thing I think is real important to recognize is seminaries get blamed a lot of times for something they cannot do. Um, I tell young men, a seminary cannot prepare you for the mission field or ministry. A purpose of a seminary, in my opinion, is to give you the tools so that you can spend the rest of your life preparing. Now, I believe and I saw this and I've seen it in so many places. You'll see guys come into seminary and they, there's like a great divide. There's the guys who like Greek and Hebrew and systematic theology. And they're on this way over here to, to scholarship and a PhD and becoming a professor. And then there's guys who are out in the street and they're ministering and witnessing. And, and they just don't really have time for all that kind of stuff. This is horrific. This is horrific. Our best theologians ought to be going to the mission field. Our best scholars ought to be going to the mission field. Why? Because if, if I'm working in an area where there's a thousand churches planted that are all sound and I plant one church that isn't too sound, it's going to do damage, but not that much. But if I go into a country that has no church and the church I'm planting is the very deep root of everything that's going to happen there, I am going to contaminate that entire country. I, when someone tells me they want to go to the mission field, when it comes to scholarship, I tell them, learn the languages. And I mean the biblical languages. Learn hermeneutics, systematic theology. Learn systematic theology so you can learn to think in a non-contradictory manner, especially ecclesiology. And then finally, church history. Church history is so important. Why? Because if Benny Hinn was sitting here right now and you asked him a question 
And he answered, and you said, why'd you answer that way? He would say, because bless God, that's what my Bible says. If you ask me the same question, I'm probably going to give you a completely different answer. And you ask me why, I'm going to say, that's what my Bible says. So we're at a stalemate. So what do we do? We go through 2,000 years of Christian history. I'm not talking about the history of Catholicism. I'm talking about the history of men and women who were redeemed by the blood of Christ and who believed the scriptures were the word of God. We go down through that, and if they all agree and they disagree with me, who's probably wrong? And also, the reason why church history is so important on the mission field and one of the most neglected things on the mission field is that in many cases, people are going to be converted out of a national religion that claims that it goes back to the very creation of time. And they're going to say that these believers in Christ have joined some Western modern sect. And those believers need to understand that they're part of redemptive history that goes back before even the fall of Adam to the very decrees of God. They need to know that. And it gives them strength when they do. We cannot commend all our students. You realize that. I'm sorry, I don't don't have anything against some of you, but we cannot commend all our students because all we can guarantee is that you're going to get taught uh, the disciplines of theology, the four departments of theology, you're going to get taught it from a, a standpoint that is confessional and won't contradict the confession, but we can't prepare you for the ministry sitting out in a church a thousand miles from us. We can take responsibility for like Cody and and uh, Ryan sitting there in the 10th row. We can't take responsibility for you. Uh, you have to be under elders. They have to be mentoring you and they have to be the ones commending you. And, and uh, was one of my stubborn principles of doing seminary is uh, we can give, we can give our seminary students a confessional theological education. Well, we can't commend them to the ministry if we've met you twice. Uh, we, w- we want, you, if we're going to do that, we have to, we have to be your pastors too and have you in our church and get to know you and, and then send you out. That's, this is why when, even though we have a site where our students can see opportunities that are out there and uh, they can maybe, and churches can see them, uh, we, we call it a, a, a dating site but with the parents involved, because we're not your pastors and we're not the pastors that are going to call you. And so that's a really important commitment and distinction that we have to make as Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't want to bring Coles to Newcastle on this, but I do want to confirm what I'm hearing. I have students ask me sometime about trying to hierarchize the what is to be learned in the seminary. And I think the first thing and the most important thing is to learn how to deal with scripture, how to interpret the Bible, how to understand the Bible. So if you're gonna be a teacher of God's people, you've got to really be an expert in that. You have to use all the tools that are available. So learn your Greek, learn your Hebrew, learn principles of hermeneutics, learn how the whole Bible fits together, develop for yourself a biblical theology in that way. Second thing you should know is systematic theology. You have to know the Bible is consistent, that it doesn't contradict itself. Uh, It has great complexities in it sometimes. That's what leads to some of the richness in our theological reasoning and systematic theology. But if you can't learn how to put the entire story together and all of its different doctrines and show how those doctrines, even the the coherent expression of particular doctrines are also coherent with with other places of Scripture, then you're really not going to know the Bible. And then the third thing is you should know the history of the church. Just like Paul said, you should understand that there can be a almost a consensus of witness in the history of the church that becomes a a virtual uh, uh, obligation for you to believe, like the, the Council of Nicaea. They work through all the Christological issues, and though the Council of Nicaea is very short, the, the Creed of Nicaea is very short. In terse, but nevertheless, if, if there are things in it that you disagree with, substantial matters you disagree with, you should question yourself and not the, not the creed of Nicaea because you're the, the doctrine of the Trinity is condensed in that and the, and the deity and humanity of Christ and the fact that he, for us men and for our salvation, came down and was made flesh and was made man and, and so forth. So those are, those are condensed truths 
So church history becomes a very important thing. And <clears throat> also, uh, we don't need to think that it's that missionaries are the ones who should sort of be the least qualified to be pastors here, or the least qualified to engage in a, the complex North American culture or something like that. It's going to be a much more complex engagement in other places where you have to deal with other religions and you have to deal with the multiplicity of them and other philosophical ideas. And you're going to have to have that ability to understand what Christian theology is, what Christian history is, and you're going to have to be able to put it even in an apologetic framework. Not that you are going to convince anybody of yourself to become a Christian, but there are the means that you need to use as a good steward of these things. And so, so being a missionary calls for a, a high degree of giftedness and a high degree of stewarded expertise in those things that constitute Christian revelation. So those are, I think, are some important, some important issues about what it means to discern if, if you may be qualified and may be being called to be a missionary. Can you engage in a different culture with that kind of thorough commitment and knowledge of what the Christian faith really is? Just to come back then to the place where you start, the most important thing is first learn what it is to be a committed churchman what it is to be a member of a church. Learn how to love people. Learn how to love the Lord. Let me say something to you young men. You know, I'm kind of known for talking about true conversion and the evidences of true conversion, all these things. It took me years of studying the scriptures to come to what I believe. And I'll never forget one day after years of study and having come to a conclusion about uh, the evidence of faith, the evidence of genuine repentance and all these things struggled years. I opened up the Heidelberg Catechism by accident and fell upon a few questions that answered every one of my questions. <laughs> That's pitiful. That's pitiful. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, if, if I in seminary, if I could trade all my seminary training for going through the catechism of a guy you don't even know, Hercules Collins, I would have been a far more trained and equipped man on the mission field or young man than I was. And so don't don't despise these things. They've been used throughout history to make men grounded and to give them some sort of sounding board. For the faith. Hercules Collins was a pastor of a church called Wapping Baptist Church. <laughs> That's why I like him. <laughs> I remember sitting in doctoral seminars at Southern, and we'd be discussing something in a colloquium, and guys would be saying stuff, and I would have red lights and yellow lights going off in my mind as they went down certain tracks of, of thinking. And uh, I, I, I was thinking to myself, these are doctoral students. What's wrong with them? Don't they know what they're doing? And the fact of the matter is that the difference was that I understood the historic confession and they'd never studied it. And so they didn't have the, 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 the margins, the rails, that in God's kind providence, I'd be given because I understood the confession of faith and the historic, the historic mainstream of the Christian tradition. We did have a few late questions come in that uh, I promised someone I would try to slip in. So I'm going to just combine two of them here. Um, says... Okay, one is help us navigate the need for elder missionaries with the energy of younger men and the wisdom of older men. What's too young for an elder? And following that, should there be age requirements for elders and deacons? Uh, as the youngest one here. <laughs> 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 I'm in my 40s. <laughs> but Timothy was probably in his 40s when he was called a young man. Yeah. And part of the answer, at least, is to say this. That's why you have a Paul and a Timothy. That's why you have 
more than one going. You have the the older, wiser, and the younger together, yeah. and it's not uh, separate and alone. Uh, at least that's what I see as part of the answer in Scripture. Was Paul the older of Paul and Barnabas? Or was I think Paul Barnabas the, was the older. You think Barnabas was the older? Huh. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think if I should share this story or not, uh, or actually two stories. Uh, I think sometimes it depends on the age of the church. Um, this is a little, literally true story. I mean, this is back in 1970, 1975, six and seven. Uh, my wife and I joined the Reformed Baptist Church of Grand Rapids, which is now Grace Emanuel Reformed Baptist Church. We're the 20th and 21st members. And in 1977, they asked me to become one of four elders. Not one of our four elders was 30 yet. But that wasn't a problem because the oldest people in the church weren't quite probably 40 yet. <laughs> so it, it does depend a little bit on the situation, I think. That's not an excuse because did we make mistakes? We sure did. But the problem was, there weren't any other Reformed Baptist churches within 500 miles of Grand Rapids, Michigan back in 1975. Mm. We were having to figure this out basically on our own mm. and with the help of some brethren, maybe out on the East Coast someplace. So I do think, but I do think it has to do with the relative maturity of the church. How many of you have seen the picture of Spurgeon when he was 19? Mm. Standing yeah. with the elders at the New Park Street pulpit. Mm -hmm. He's just standing up <laughs> as straight as he could and got this slick back black hair and doesn't have his beard. And then, and then all these men are sitting there and they've got white sideburns, and white hair, and beards. It's just, it is a picture of contrast. But who was the most mature among that group? 19 year old Spurgeon was and a lot of it is because of how he grew up and what he learned even before he was converted and what he read and what he knew and so there's it would probably not be good to try to set a, a, a an age no one under 20 can do this or it, it it does depend upon experience it depends upon how quickly a person matures it depends on their their convictions and and whether or not they have genuine leadership skills so it I was just going to say, if I may, as the younger one, uh, <laughs> it, it, the issue is not age, it's maturity. In my Bible reading this morning, I was reading the words of Elihu, who says, it's not the old who are wise, nor the aged who understand what is right. <laughs> now, <laughs> the point being, boy, do I feel rebuked. <laughs> <laughs> Too shame. Not, not that, but the point being, it is it is the spirit of the Lord working through His Word that matures people at different, yeah, different rates, and that that thing is the issue of maturity, not of age mm. alone. But but let me let me say something here. Um, we have become basically a very stupid people, an ignorant people. And I want to give you a case in point. Um, I studied very hard in college, very hard, and I made very good grades. I studied very hard in seminary. I made very, very good grades. I'm saying that because when I graduated, a friend, knowing that I liked, I, I appreciated logic, even in my secular days, that he sent me a book on logic, a friend of mine from Canada, for my graduation present. I read through the first chapter three times because it was defining terms, which is absolutely essential in logic. And I thought to myself, this is without a doubt the most difficult work of logic in this first chapter that I have ever studied. And I went to Murray State University, the University of Texas, Southwestern Theological Seminary, and I thought, this is very difficult. I read through the first chapter three times. And then I laid the book down, went to get some milk in the kitchen, came back, and I happened to look at the covering, and it was like an ink sketching on the covering. So it caught my eye. I hadn't paid attention to it. And I see a headmaster standing over children that look to be about nine years old. 
And I discovered that it was basically the basic curriculum for children in the colonial period. Also, when you look at the age in which young men are getting married, you've got to realize that, that we're experiencing an Isaiah 3 judgment on our nation. Where little boys are railing against men and women are ruling over them and so on and so forth. And so with great caution, only with great caution and with the confirmation of older men, should you as younger men ever take upon yourself the mantle of an elder or a missionary. And but I will say this, there is nothing wrong with a man being brought into the ministry or even go to the mission field that at that moment is not necessarily elder qualified, but is submitted to elder qualified men and continues his learning through them. This is John Mark, who was probably in, was probably intended to become uh, what he was not yet. And that was a qualified uh missionary and elder, right? Um, I know of a situation close to me where people in a church had been burned by certain younger elders uh, that they'd had before. And so when a qualified man was put up who was in his 30s, they, they wanted to argue, some of them, that he was too young. Mm. Well, of course, the point was... Um, the qualification for being a priest in Israel was 30, and uh, that's when Jesus entered the ministry as well as formal ministry. So I do think sometimes it's these kind of background issues where people have been burned and they've seen problems with younger men that kind of complicate this issue too. It is... Uh... It's quite common for missionary to need a secular vocation just to enable them to live in the country they are seeking to reach. Should every everyone preparing for the mission field be willing to consider such tent making ministry? They should be willing to consider it, but it's not ideal. And I wrote down here in Acts 18 makes it clear that when Paul labored as a tent maker, until the arrival of Silas and Timothy. Then he began devoting himself completely to the word. And um, I appreciate those men who, who do it because it's the only way to get into the country, but it, it's not ideal. Now, when you move from a cross-cultural missionary to an indigenous missionary, it becomes almost impossible. Most of the men that were in my church in Peru are the men I've known overseas in the different countries that I've worked in now. They don't work eight hours a day. There's no such thing as a part-time job. A part-time job will not even begin to feed your family. These men work 12 and 14 hours a day just to bring home enough food for their children. So to think that they're then going to work in the ministry is almost an impossibility. And so, yes, we ought to be willing to do it. And sometimes it is necessary. And in the States, it is possible. But I believe we should follow Paul's example. If you've been called to preach the word, then anything that will free you to do that needs to be grabbed hold of. Amen. In certain cultures, might it be best for a missionary to set aside his Christian liberty and abstain from drinking alcoholic beverages because of the cultural situation? Well, I'll <laughs> Don't even get me started. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter what situation you're in. Paul says that we should set aside our Christian liberties if it's an offense for our brother anywhere, whether it's here or whether it's on the mission field. We shouldn't claim our liberties as our as, as absolute rights that we're being persecuted if we can't claim all, all of our liberties. Um, so we do what is edifying for the brothers, what will uh, commend our character to them. And so, yeah, we should be willing to set aside liberties. We can't set aside anything that's absolute. We can't compromise our doctrine and be willing to say, oh, well, you're not really sinners. You can, you can make it by burning perfume or something like that. You can't set aside those things, but what we call Christian liberties, you can. But we also don't need to be willing to condemn others uh, I think James is dealing with this when he says that you, uh, in the things in which you condemn another, 
or you are condemning the law of, of God. We, we think, well, if there's not a law against that, there ought to be. Uh, so, so, so we have to work both ways ourselves. We can't condemn others for their liberties unless we see, unless we want to talk with them and advise them and say, I think you're being an offense to people by taking this. And if you value the gospel and value your ministry, perhaps you should consider giving that up. But I think anytime we should be willing to forsake our liberties. I think the thing that bothers me the most is um, we've actually, it seems like the younger culture has moved from that question to, to flaunting liberty on social media, you know, and um, it, it, it just does not demonstrate love, it doesn't demonstrate uh, my wife says it this way. Some people just need a high five in the face with a chair. Um, but, but I want that was my wife says that. Um, but I, I see flaunting of liberty. And, and um, there are believers that are, I would say, far more strict than myself. And and even. Um, you could say borderline fall into legalism, but they take holiness seriously, which is unusual in our day. And to trample on the heart of some precious believer like that is a very, very dangerous offense. You know, I'm jealous for upholding the fact that God has 10 commandments, and not 23. But if we're going to really help people uh, you know, are, are they going to listen to us? Who are they going to listen to? Some man who just flaunts his Christian liberty and, and then tries to teach them the doctrine of Christian liberty? Or are they, going to, are they going to listen to the guy who restrains himself, gives up uh, his, his use of that liberty, and still teaches them? You know, uh, the Bible really doesn't say or teach, you know, there's anything wrong with alcoholic beverages. If we use it in moderation, who's 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 that person going to listen to ultimately and be be enlightened in terms of what the Bible actually says on the issue, except the man who's more restrained and careful in those use of the Christian liberty? Yes. There's an interesting. Um, do small local churches have a responsibility to give to church planting missions? particularly when they're not even able to support their own pastor full-time. Go ahead. I just wrote down here, um, I feel very strongly about this. A small church should participate in the Great Commission from the beginning, and financial giving should be a part of that. However, until they can support their pastor, so that he might live with dignity, the greater part of their participation should be through informed prayer. The scriptures inform us that the church is acting faithfully and doing well to send missionaries on their way in a manner worthy of God, 3 John. But more direct commands are given to the church regarding the care of their pastors. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And um, I just want to say this, what you've got to realize is without strong pastors and strong local churches, there will eventually be no biblical missionaries. Should the church consider having members who are paid full-time evangelists? It seems interesting that some churches today will have several pastors of all kinds of different ministries and yet not have any member whose full-time calling and role is to reach the lost in their community. Well, we talked a little bit about this in our lunch meeting yesterday. and The <clears throat> scripture says that when Christ ascended, he gave gifts to men and he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers uh, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And <clears throat> the question was whether or not the apostles and prophets and evangelists were all extraordinary 
gifts that are given. And then the pastor teacher is the one that is remaining as the ordinary gift. And I think that there's an argument that can be made for that. But I, my personal position on that is that evangelist is still one of the gifts that is given to, to the church. Uh, and if, what, what were they saying? Were they agreeing with me? Yeah, or they telling me to shut up. I'm not used to that. That's all. I, I had a teacher one time that was teaching Old Testament. And he was teaching something about higher criticism. And uh, he said, all right, are there any questions now? And hands went up. He said, do I see a hand back there or is that a sword? <laughs> so that's what I wonder sometimes. Is that a hand or is that a sword? But what was I talking about? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, I, the, the, the prophets and the apostles, at least in my understanding of the, of the New Testament, were those in the New Testament era who received special revelation. All the churches had to be taught the new covenant. They had to have Christ's life interpreted and Christ's death interpreted and the whole Christian life interpreted and sanctification and the work of the Spirit. And this was an ongoing process. And the Apostle Paul wanted to return to churches to give them more of this this teaching from apostolic authority. And the prophets were those who rose up in the churches that were given special revelation. They received special revelation. It was of a canonical sort, whether or not the particular teachings they got were ever canonized. I think they probably were within the whole fabric of the canon at some time. But, but those were given in order that we might have a full understanding, a full revelatory display of the work of Christ. The evangelist was one that was specially gifted at a, a winsome presentation of the gospel and would be greatly blessed in his, in his preaching. And while there might have been extraordinary operations of the Spirit in those evangelists during the New Testament, still the task that they have is not one that is ex exclusively revelatory as the apostles and the prophets his task is something that is an ongoing task. The canon is complete. Evangelism is not complete. And so I, I do think that there are people that are given special gifts of evangelism uh, and that they should be considered as a part of a church staff or part of the elders uh, with a, a specific assignment, not excluding all teaching because they all need to be qualified to do that, but, but have a particular appointment and particular gifts in going to the lost in the community or setting up places in the community where regular preaching uh, can be done or, or uh, realizing, getting lists of those who are lost and have indicated interest in the church and being able to go and speak with them. I think that there is a place for an ongoing office of uh, evangelist among the elders in, in local churches now. Wow. <laughs> the um, for those of you, maybe some of you younger guys, you're going, well, why is this even a question? Um, if you look in many of, of the reformers, particularly John Calvin, uh, they saw the evangelist as a Timothy who was an authorized uh, representative or messenger of the apostolic witness. And I, I don't. I don't agree with that, but also the fact that in First Timothy um, we have elders and deacons, their offices described in chapter three, the qualifications, but not an evangelist. So some it's led people to assume that, but I don't think there's a. I disagree with that respectfully. Respectfully disagree with that. I would like to read something from a man I think we all appreciate, Dr. MacArthur. When I was studying this issue, I wanted to see where different people came down, and I thought this was very edifying. He said, it is my conviction that each local assembly should raise up evangelists to send some out in mission enterprises and to have others remain permanently in the church fellowship to teach, mobilize, and lead others out to fulfill the commission of winning the lost to Christ. Every church should be led by a combination of evangelists and teaching shepherds men gifted to bring the lost in and men gifted for feeding believers and leading them in the word to build them up. I, I've discovered over the years, if someone's a street preacher or used to be before they started filming themselves, 
If someone was a street preacher, everyone automatically assumed this guy is really spiritual. Why? Because he's out there in the front lines. And it's easy to develop that tendency where you see another man who doesn't feel comfortable doing that, but has more of a teaching ministry. And sometimes he would be accused of being timid or or not as spiritual. And I think we can all see how just how just wrong that is. I, over the years, have come to see the wisdom of Christ in gifting men and women in so many different ways. And I'm afraid that because we have lost this this work of the evangelist, we have added great grief to the pastoral elder ministry. And, And there are some men, yes, that have both gifts, you may say. They said that of Spurgeon, but I see that Spurgeon still is carrying that out in the pulpit and not necessarily house to house. He may have been. I don't know, but it didn't seem like it. But my whole point is. My children will always ask me, Dad, what should I do with my life? And my answer is always, well, what do you want to do with your life? And that sounds almost carnal. But when you think about it, God put an earnestness in Titus's heart in Second Corinthians eight to go to Corinth. There are things that men love to do. There are men I know that would fall apart standing on a chair in the middle of a plaza preaching. But you put them in a pulpit or a teaching situation and the church will be edified like nothing you've ever seen. Let the man alone and let him do his work. But but put with him men that will go out and go house to house and in the street and everything else. And I think if we would do that, we would we would allow our gifted teachers to spend most of their time doing what they're gifted at and not having to be constantly concerned about I'm not doing evangelism because um, I'm really not the brightest crayon in the box. I mean, I, I know I'm not and I'm not that well educated. And, and I'm not someone who is teaching like some of these men every day, but I know how difficult it is to prepare the teaching for Christ's church. It's it's not a five hour job or a 10 hour job. It could sometimes 20, 30 hours. And it's not just the specific teaching you're given, but all the study that you must do in order to come to a holistic understanding of the will of God and the person of God. It requires a devotion. There's nothing wrong with a man spending 40, 50 hours a week doing nothing but but studying in order to proclaim like Ezra. Yeah, he studied the law, he lived it, and he taught it. And if we had evangelists in our church to complement those kind of men, I think it would be amazing. And even, even if you were someone who rejected the idea that the specific New Testament gift of evangelists continued to today, if you had a proper view of the plurality of eldership, in which you recognize that all, you're, each elder is more blessed and gifted in certain areas, there would be nothing to keep from ha- have, having the elder who's gift, most gifted in evangelism. That's his primary area of ministry as an elder in the church. But, but I think that's true, but I think this, that it is really good when you have this young man and he's wondering about where he fits in the body. And like you said yesterday in your own life, all of a sudden one day it just clicked. I'm a history teacher. This is what I do. This is what I do. There is so much power in coming to the realization of I this is what I do. I win souls. Or and it, with that winsomeness that our brother spoke about, because remember, the gospel's good news. A lot of times this gifted person doesn't necessarily win the soul. It's just with his winsomeness, his kindness, his message. He brings that soul into the church and the church sits under the teaching of the teacher and is converted. And I just think there's power in being able to say, you know, Dwight L. Moody said, don't give me a man who's good at many things. Give me a man who does one thing. And, and it, I think it's really neat to have somebody that, that goes, this is what I do. I really do. That's where you have the diversity of gifts yeah. in the church. And even historically, for Baptists, you also have... This is another reason we plant churches. Yes, yeah. churches. We plant churches. 
But historically, you also have gifted brothers, our confession talks about, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's an important aspect as well. So men who maybe aren't called to eldership, but they have gifts of preaching. Even then, historically, our particular Baptist brothers, they would test, see, do they actually have the gift of preaching before the congregation? And then they would go out and preach under the authority of the church as those who are part of the church. One of the difficulties in our own day is, as we've talked about, men who are self-proclaimed anything, self-proclaimed pastors, self-proclaimed evangelists, doing these things apart from the church is, is a major issue. But that's not what we're, we're let advocating. Me, let me add something to this. Let, let me show you what, what's hurting us. I believe this is an issue that hurts us, that we need to encourage and we need to name men who are evangelists in the local church. But the other thing is, I do not think the honor, the respect, and the, how would I say it? There are not enough resources of training placed into the ministry of the deacon. And I believe that pastors are severely limited in their own ministry because they're having to carry out much of the ministry of a deacon. And we need to exalt that ministry in the church to where it's not something people laugh about anymore, but it's the, it is an honorable, honorable position. And the Bible talks about it that way. And, and, and here's the thing, guys, it, like like David Miller always says, it's not rocket surgery. All right. <laughs> you, you, you look, it sounds like him, doesn't it? It, look, guys, you, you know, running around. I remember one time I had to go into this really big church. It had blown up and they wanted me to come in there and help them and all this stuff. And I'm, I was a young man and there's like 800 members and I'm sitting in the auditorium and praying and walking around in the balcony going, you know, how can I fix this church? You know, maybe we should have able groups or we should do this and do that. And I sat down in a chair and it's like, hey, stupid. <laughs> um, they just need biblical elders and biblical deacons, and that's it. Amen. And that'll heal this thing. And but but that deacon ministry, I'm coming to believe, is so much more important than what we're giving it credit for. Amen. Well, we're already a little over time, but let me just throw out this one last question. Um, uh, probably answer it in a, in a short sentence. What is the most important advice that you would give to a domestic church planter today? A domestic church planter. You plant a church just like you pastor one. There's no esoteric church planting knowledge that you need. Grow in your knowledge of the scriptures with regard to the way that God's people should be evangelized in the way that they should be cared for in the context of a local church. Study the scriptures and devote yourself to sola scriptura. Become a part of a good local church so that they can recognize you and send you out and you have their support when you go into the really difficult work of church planning. Remember that it's Christ who builds the church and not you. And remember to cultivate a heart like Christ's, and that Christ loves the church, and so should you. Right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, no, go ahead, Dr. Well, I, I don't have anything to add, really, other than Paul said that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And he said, great is the mystery of God in this which we confess. And they gave a six-article confession of faith that deals with the incarnation of Christ and then the ascension of Christ uh, and the Christ being believed on in the world. And so the uh, realize that you've got to speak the truth. You need to know the truth. You've got to speak the truth. You have to preach the truth. You have to be convinced there is such a thing as revealed truth. And that is what is bringing people out of the world and out of their, their false ideas and the lies that they live according to. We have a revelation from God uh, and that is what the church is here to do is to preach that truth, conform people's lives to that truth. And so unless you're convinced that the truth of God, the revealed truth of God is more powerful than anything, is more transforming than anything, if you think you're going to come up with any kind of 
manipulative, manipulative devices or any kind of secrets that are not in the scripture, then you're not yet qualified to be a church planner. Got to move to the truth. Amen. Amen.